brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to the Badminton Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Henry. And we're the co-founders of Volantware, and we're here because we love badminton. Thanks so much for joining us. We're so excited to be here with the next episode of our podcast. If you want to find out more about what our podcast is about and why we started, please listen to our introduction episode. Today, we have a very special guest on this episode. His name is Stuart, and he is the current national junior coach and performance manager for Badminton Australia. In this role, he is responsible for the management of the entire national junior program and travels with teams to key international events such as the World Junior Championships and Youth Olympic Games. Stuart also runs a comprehensive badminton program at St. Peter's College in Adelaide, where he resides and coaches several state and national junior players privately. Before moving to Australia at the age of 20, Stuart was part of the Badminton England's national team from 2004 to 2011. During his time as a player, Stuart competed in numerous international events at junior and senior level. He was granted a distinguished talent visa to permanently reside in Australia in 2016, given his ability to contribute to Australian badminton as a player, coach and administrator. Stuart was ranked number one in Australia in 2016 for men's singles and became Australian national champion in mixed doubles in 2015. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast, Stu. Okay, thanks so much, guys, for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be involved with it. Let's crack on. Great. Stu, we played a teams event just recently, the BV Teams Invitational, where we played with some junior players. That was heaps and heaps of fun. And for those who don't know Stuart Rowland, he's so integral in Badminton Australia junior program, and he's really helping to shape the pathway for the juniors into the seniors. So really happy and really excited to have you on, Stu. So thanks for being here. So Stu, just with an opening question that we usually do ask all of our guests on this podcast, when did you start playing badminton and how did you actually get started? So I started playing badminton when I was 11 years old at secondary school. I actually was a tennis player throughout the whole of my childhood and um, yeah, stumbled into badminton in secondary school. My, my mum bought me a racket for about £10, which um, <laughs> I think is probably about $15. Um, oh, maybe a bit more than that, about $20. And forced me to go to, to badminton training after school on a Monday and Wednesday because she basically couldn't find anyone to look after me, so I had no choice. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, that, was, that was when I started. And um, it just quickly took off. Yeah, I, I loved playing. I loved racket sports anyway, and I had a bit of a knack for it because of the skills from tennis. So met some people at school that were, eventually became great friends with and, and never looked back, really. I think what, what sort of hooked me in was the fact that I, it was a totally different sort of environment. I think tennis in England is quite, um, I wouldn't say an, an upper class sport, but it's more, you know, it's, it's probably more people that play it who are upper class and you know at private school and I tended to gel better with the kids in badminton because I'd come from a slightly different background so yeah that, that was kind of how I started but ended up leaving tennis because of it which was disappointing for, for the people that I was involved you know for the people who'd helped me through the years of tennis. That's quite interesting because me personally as well I was a tennis player during my childhood and I uh, switched to badminton when I was 15 to 16 years old. I guess similar story to you, but uh, instead of my mum, it was uh, a good friend of mine that taught me how to play badminton at that age. Mm. No, no, I think it's quite common. I think, you know, there are so, the hitting skills, like the hand-eye coordination that you need in badminton, are obviously almost identical to tennis. It's just changing techniques slightly and you know, even the, in, even the movements very similarly. If you've got the agility skills from the tennis court, it's really easy to shift to badminton. But I do think that it's it's harder to go the other way. Like I've never seen, or to this day, I've not seen somebody successfully make the transition from badminton to tennis. I don't know if you, either of you two have seen that, but I haven't. I've seen it the other way like a number of times. I've um, seen it 
same thing. I haven't seen really anyone transition that way either. So, yeah, so yeah. I mean, that could be interesting for the listeners out there now that, you know, if you've got a kid that you're working with or your own child is playing, playing tennis and, you know, they're having a hard time or they're not making the progress they want to make or they're not enjoying it, try badminton. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of scope in badminton to do well, arguably a lot easier in Australia because there's not so many people playing. We're trying to change that and make it more popular. But, yeah, I think, I think the skills are really transferable. But if anyone out there can prove me wrong that you can go from badminton to being a great tennis player, I'd love to see it. <laughs> That's really true. And so, Stu, because you had that tennis background, then you went into badminton, there must be a reason why you love to play badminton and you decided to take that on more than tennis. Could you just tell us why you actually love badminton and the benefits of badminton, say, over tennis or any other sport? I think oh, you're asking me to go back in time, mate. I've, got to, I've really got to wind back the clock to think about that. I, I love badminton is great it's really high intensity like, that's one thing that I love about it you, you you are working really hard out there I think as well like it was a whole different set of technical skills even though it was still a racket badminton is a very intricate skill set when you're actually on the court working with your racket skills um, and that's not to say that tennis isn't but it was just a different set of skills and I think I really enjoyed trying to master it's arguably a bit more diverse with the skills. A lot of tennis these days is just played on the back line. You know, you just see ground strokes mm-hmm. all day, which, you know, it's exciting, it's powerful. But badminton has obviously the power with the smash, but there's a lot of front court play and defensive skills that are really, you know, highly technical skills that you don't see as much on the tennis court. So I think for me, yeah, the intensity on the court and also those, you know, really fine technical um, racket skills were probably the thing that I enjoyed the most. And then obviously trying to move through in a new sport and, you know, achieve my aspirations. I always had um, aspirations as a, as a little boy to, to play sport at the, the highest level. And in tennis, I was doing okay. I was, um, I was playing tennis at county level at under 12 age, I think. And then had some trials for national team wasn't quite good enough and badminton maybe I thought oh maybe this is my calling so yeah I I mean hopefully that answers the question yeah it does and we're glad you made the switch (laughs) (laughs) thanks Henry (laughs) I'm glad I did too as well (laughs) it's it's opened up a lot of doors for me you know not just not just as a player but also you know with with work as well it's given me an opportunity to do to live a life that I, I probably wouldn't have been able to live otherwise and be out here in Australia. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be here in Australia either if it wasn't for badminton. So, thank you, badminton, and people that push me to pick up the racket and and get the best out of myself. Yeah. So, can you tell us about how you are involved with badminton on the day to day basis now? Yep. Uh, it's it's all badminton in my life now, which which was a change. I did go into um, I did go into the corporate world for a couple of years. I worked at an accounting firm in Adelaide, which was totally different for me. Coming from you know, I was basically playing badminton and studying. Two years in corporate was enough for me. I just didn't like the the nine to five or yeah eight to six grind. I wanted to be on my feet. I wanted to be working with people. It was different for me going almost backwards in terms of leadership as well. When I was in badminton, I was I very much, I felt like I was a leader. I was presenting to, to athletes, to players, to coaches. When I went into corporate, I'd, um, you know, I was basically at the bottom again, which psychologically was a bit hard to take. But so now my life in badminton involves working for Bamson Australia that's a part-time role it's a busy part-time role with a lot of travel and then I work at a private school called St Peter's College in Adelaide and I do a little bit of private on the side with some some state and national junior players but a standard day for me would be coaching seven till about eight thirty in the morning at school mm-hmm. um, and then I basically go into the office at school and even though I'm working for Badminton Australia, whose head office is based in Melbourne, I actually work from Adelaide, which is great. Our national junior players are spread out all over the country, so there's no need for us to centralise the programme right now. So I can do all my administration and management work on behalf of BA whilst being at the school. So from 8.30 till probably around 3.30, 4 o'clock, I'm doing a mixture of both my my school work and also my, my work for Badminton Australia. And then straight after school, it's either school coaching or it's, or it's private coaching. So that, 
and that often goes on till about 7 p.m. So my standard day is about, is about 12 hours, wow. which is a long day. But I think, you know, because I have that mixture of office work and, and on court, it, it breaks it up a little bit and it, it keeps my mind um, stimulated throughout the day. Yeah, I was just about to say that, Stu. You're still within the realms of badminton and you're just doing badminton full time, basically, but you've got the different aspects of the sport throughout your day. So it does give you that variety and hopefully it's something that you can maintain and you can sustain and you can keep enjoying to do rather than I know some people who do badminton full time, but they're on court all day and they're coaching all day and that is very taxing. But yeah. you having kind of that administration role, organizational role, leadership role, plus the coaching role as well. I think that's, that's really healthy in your lifestyle, even though you do have really busy days. Yeah. I spot on Jeff. Like I do not think I could, I could do on court every day, six, seven hours a day. I probably spend, I try and limit my on court time. I think it's really important that a coach as involved as I am maintains their passion, enthusiasm and energy for badminton. And if I'm spending six hours a day on the court by the end of the week, the end of the month and the end of the year, I'm just going to be totally exhausted and burnt out. So I do try and spread my on court time over the week. And I think the other, the other part of what I do that I really like is that I still see the whole spectrum of badminton players. So I work at my school. I have some year, I have some year five boys that you know, come up from the primary school to train with me that have really only just picked up the racket. I also have some year nine boys and year 10 boys that are brand new to the sport have come from another sport. I have some boys at my school that are playing state and they want to, you know, they want to do well nationally. And then obviously the BA part of my life, I'm lucky enough to work with, you know, the most talented kids that we have playing badminton in Australia. So I really do see the whole spectrum of junior badminton, which is, which is quite special. And it allows me to stay, I hope, quite, quite grounded. I don't forget what it's like to be a total beginner, mm -hmm. but I don't get so attached to beginners um, that I, you know, lose my, appreciation and understanding and knowledge that's important to coach the very best junior players and, and get them to transition successfully to senior badminton. Yeah. Stuart, sounds like badminton has had a really big impact on your life, both as an athlete and as a professional like you are right now. If I was going to ask the next question, I think it'd be really special to know and understand what was the number one lesson or thing that you learned from badminton? What did badminton teach you just in life in general and where you are right now? I think I've always been quite quite a hard working person like I've if I've had a goal I've always been willing to push but I think badminton has perhaps enabled me to really live that like I, I you know with sport at a high level if you if you want to achieve stuff you really do have to be diligent you have to understand sacrifice you know I gave up a lot of social time as a kid to pursue my badminton and then later on I really had to just make badminton the priority around my academics when I was doing my my A levels in England my first degree and then my masters so you know it, it's taught me to balance it's taught me to focus it's taught me hard work I'd, I'd probably say they were the main the main things that it's taught me there's there's probably many other things that I'm not aware of but yeah I, I do think in the, in the long run it's made me a much much better person and allowed me to succeed in, in other areas of my life. And do you think those lessons have translated into your ability to coach as well now that you're a coach? I think so. Like what, one thing that I love about coaching is that I get to draw on all my experiences and I'm, I am quite a young coach. I'm only 28 years old. So it was only when I was really pushing to be a professional player in the UK around 18, 19, it was, only, it was less than a decade ago. So those experiences are still, you know, they're quite recent. So I get to spend, you know, most, day, most of the days in my life working with kids that have the same goals that I had, but I get to basically try and help them make decisions that I should have made. So I can, you know, make them aware. I can lead the horse to water. I can't always make it drink, but I can try. And I think that process for me is like really enjoyable. And when I see kids making not necessarily the right choices, but the, the right choices to allow them to achieve their goals in badminton and to live that with them is very rewarding. Absolutely, Stu. And I guess the next question that I want to ask you, because of your background as an athlete, so you've had many coaches in England when you were trying for the national team and when you were in the national team, then you've come to Australia, you've played very competitively as well, and then you've become a coach yourself. Just as for the main topic of this podcast episode, we were talking about coaching and coaches. What do you feel makes a great coach? I know that's a very broad question to be asking, 
But just in general, what do you feel makes a really great coach and what can someone be looking out for in a coach if they are actually looking for one? Obviously, this is where I spend all my time now. So it's something I spend a great deal of time thinking about as well. And I look back at when I first started coaching. I think a lot of players, when they first start coaching, they do it as a side thing to help them generate a bit of money, to help them you know, further their playing career. But as a player, you, you come out of playing very confident and very um, you know, egotistical in a way. Like You're quite arrogant. You think that everything that you do is what your players should do. If I look back at the way I was as a coach when I, was, when I first started coaching, I think I was 16, 17. I got my level one in, with Babington, England. The way I coached back then and what I thought was right is totally different now. And the way I coach, like the way I see everything is so different. I'm much more analytical now. I question everything I do. And I'm sure in 10 years' time, I'll look back at this podcast and I'll say, what you were talking rubbish then as well. (laughs) Yeah, you didn't Um, know anything. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know anything. But I think that's life, isn't it? You know, you just always just, you're you're trying to make the steps to become a better version of yourself. And it's not a bad thing that you look back at yourself 10 years ago and say, you know, you knew nothing, mate. But at the time, you think you know everything. But I mean, right now, I'll, I'll be doing a session plan before whichever session it is. Quite often, I just sit there staring at a blank piece of paper for you know, 15, 20 minutes because I I find a reason to write off every idea that I've had for the session because, oh, that player won't benefit from that. They need to work on this. Oh, but we did that last week. Oh, that drill won't work. I'm constantly questioning everything, which is actually quite frustrating, but I think it's healthy. And in the end, like I'm, I'm going to come closer to getting the best, you know, the the best outcome for, for all the players I work with. So I think, I mean, your question was what, what makes a good coach, but I think that is good coaching is when you start to to really break down and analyze what you do is, is really important. I think for me as well, often a lot of coaches think that teaching technique is, is everything, you know, like, oh, I have to be a, the, best, the best coach of, you know, racket skills and, and footwork. Yes, technical coaching is an aspect of coaching. But to me, managing the person, regardless whether they're seven years old and they've just picked up the racket or they're 19 years old and they've just come out of playing a world junior championships and reaching the quarterfinals it's still about the person and I mean I'm sort of stealing this saying from somebody else but you know I think it's more important that you coach the person than coaching the sport and I see so many people that focus purely on the sport and they forget the person so that would be like my second message for what makes a good coach is that they actually care about the person a really a really good saying that I hold quite close is athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care yeah that, that's just something that I hold quite close and I try and um, you know implement that into my daily coaching and my last thing that I'll say what makes a good coach and this is sort of around the same area I think coaching has to be about the process it has to be about and it can't be about the outcome it has to be about creating an environment and a culture where kids, adults, players, whatever, can, can excel. And if you can create a culture that is healthy and, and people are motivated, they're listening to the coach, actually the technical side of the game becomes less important. Not, not to say it's not important, obviously it's incredibly important, but if you can facilitate an environment that allows people to excel, I think you're going to get better outcomes for people. That's obviously the case in many other professions as well. But I think many coaches focus purely on just the technical and less about the the holistic side of it all and the person they're actually working with. I like that you, as part of your coaching process, that you do constantly try to improve on what you do. I try. That doesn't mean I always do, but I try. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And and we know you've come from outside of Australia. And as, as an outsider coming into Australia itself, what do you see in badminton in Australia? What, what do you think there is in terms of similarities, in terms of differences, and how we can actually do better as a country? I think that everyone's fully aware of it, but one of the biggest challenges we have as a nation in Australia is, is size. It's a geography. I think from a national perspective, bringing the best players together to train together. So I, like I said before, creating that environment is so important. To do that together is challenging here. It's not a case of jumping in your car and driving two hours to a central location like you can do in the UK. Here you have to, you have to get on a plane, 
you have to fly from multiple different destinations that are sometimes four hours away that that presents a real challenge for australia that that would be um that would be the first thing one one big difference that i noticed although badminton is not hugely popular in the uk it's it's slightly higher up the chain i would say you know in australia we you know we really are like a bottom tier sport we're growing but we still are near the bottom in england it's slightly higher up which means that particularly when i was coming through as a player there was actually a reasonable amount of funding so when i was on the national program in the uk i was we had two to three uh sessions with a national coach near where we lived it was a training cell where the best players in that area trained as part of the national program um in australia we just don't have the resources to to do that sort of thing and there's a lot of people in australia don't understand that they can't understand what why is there no money going into badminton why why can we not get more money why can't we offer more support to these players it, it's mainly popularity and in, in england i think there was more money at the time being given to sport by the government i know that in australia a lot of money was taken away from sport post the sydney olympics so that's that's presented a, the popularity and the funding in australia presents a big problem as well um i think a big difference from the australia side and this is perhaps a po- this comes with good and bad there's a massive asian influence in australian badminton which you know brings in some you know some real knowledge coming across from from those countries that i think we could tap into better at times but also the people coming from those countries perhaps need to question some of their traditional coaching methods as well so i do see a, in asia i think repetition is really big for them they like hard work the whole no pain no gain do this until you you know you, you're so good at it just repeat it repeat it repeat it in the uk we're very technically focused like we'll it, it, we won't just get kids to repeat stuff over and over again if, if the technique's not right and the quality is not there we don't practice bad habits whereas in I, I could be wrong but from a lot of the stuff i've seen asian coaching methods they like volume they like doing the same exercises over again multi-shuttle drills that don't require a lot of thinking we like to get into the mind of the kids in the uk and i think because of the popularity in asia of badminton they can kind of get away with that a little bit you know it's like soccer in the uk it's like cricket in australia if you've got the volume of kids playing the sport you can kind of do what you like with them if you if you make them all work hard and do a range of drills over and over again a few of them are going to be amazing at it that's just statistics that will show you that whereas in australia like england I believe we have to be really clever with what we're doing because if we just got loads of kids playing badminton in Australia at the moment we don't but if we just put them through their paces and make them do these repetitive boring drills and physically push them all the time they're just going to pick another sport they've got so much choice and the money's not there in badminton out here either and it's the same in the UK that's why we have to be quite careful with how we you know we structure training programs to make it engaging to make it fun and so that we're different from you know we have a you know, a point of difference from the asian coaching methods and their players they they're always going to be physically not always but on the, on the most part physically better than us through the, the volume of training that they do so we have to be smarter we have to be technically different we have to have ways of of overcoming their you know their strengths i think that's something that the uk does quite well is that they think outside the box with coaching and that's led to a number of players the adcocks now ellis and smith rajiv usef doing really really well and for a long time in australia we haven't really had anyone come through and you know be challenging at that sort of level you know top 10 in the world across the five events you know we have we have we've had a few in the past and there's some really good players but we haven't challenged at that real top end yes you i completely agree with what you're saying in the asian coaching style because i've been in asia training as well as europe it is very different it is very volume focused in asia in comparison to say when i was in england or when i was in denmark or when i was in the netherlands as well so that that's a really interesting point that you bring up that perhaps a lot of the listeners may not understand or know because they're not really exposed to it they they may just think coaching is coaching and badminton is badminton and that's it but we know that that's not the case generally speaking 
And just another thing I just wanted to bring up was what you talked about with regards to a lot of Asian people or people with Asian backgrounds migrating to Australia and bringing badminton with them and how it can be a bit of a double-edged sword in terms of they're bringing in the popularity and they're bringing in their individual talents as well as the, the Asian coaching styles. But it could also be making the expectations of coaching in Australia to be same as Asia when the conditions and the environment isn't actually the same. So that's a really interesting point. And the last comment I wanted to make just with regards to that is, although we are getting a lot of numbers coming in from overseas, and that's fantastic, it's increasing our participation rates. We also hope that it's not going to segregate what our sport is about and who can be included in it as well. So just because, say, a lot of people with Asian backgrounds play the sport, we don't want to make it so that it only seems like we play this sport because I'm a Bayesian background personally. I know that you're not, Stu. But I, I also, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is just that we want to make sure that badminton is really inclusive amongst everyone. For sure. And with those, like I said, with those people coming in and playing, awesome, they're boosting our sport, but just making sure that the, the Aussies, the Australians are more than welcome to the sport. And if they give it a chance, I really believe that they'll love it as much as we all do. Yeah, t- totally, Jeff. I think everything you've said there is like, incredibly valid there's it is a double-edged sword i think the stereotype of a badminton player in australia is asian and that's not that's not a good or a bad thing it's just the way it currently is but seeing kids play badminton in pe at the, uh, the school i work at and in the past when i've gone around to other schools and, and run things when i was younger there's a lot of australian kids that really love playing they just have other choices that are more appealing to them. Badminton doesn't have the media attention or coverage. We don't have a pin-up, you know, the, the Steve Smith and Australian cricket, you know, seeing what's happening with the Ashes and everything. Like that just makes kids want to play cricket. We need something in badminton that makes white boys and girls want to play badminton. And if that's somebody white like me going into schools and being like, look at this great game, let's play. Like you could do really well at this. There's opportunities for you. Then that's what we have to do. But I think on both white people and Asian people's part, it's everyone's responsibility to make this game inclusive. And we do need to promote it as a game that is for for everyone. It's not just an Asian game that there are white players out there that are incredibly good at badminton. Victor Axelsson, world champion not too long ago, is, is a white man from Denmark. And there's lots of top players in Europe who, who are white. So I, I would love to see more white people, even other um, ethnicities playing badminton, not, not just Asians. But it's great that we are seeing more of the, the Asians come out here, which is growing the popularity of this sport and it's bringing across their, their knowledge and expertise in, in the game we love. Thanks, Stu. Um, And now I want to switch gears for a bit and actually talk about coaching as a profession, especially for those in the audience who might feel that they want to become a coach at some point, regardless of whether that's badminton or or anything, any sport or or professional or personal coaching. So tell us a bit about being uh, being a coach as as a profession. Um, So I've been coaching more or less, I wouldn't say full time, as we talked about earlier, I do have a a fairly large um, administration and management part to what I do, but I've been coaching a lot for probably about three to four years now. And then I've been doing it, you know, on the side for nearly a decade. I mean, I think it is a really rewarding profession, but it's, it's also confusing and takes up a lot of energy. There's times where I have had, you know, 15, 20 hours on court a week and I've got another two to three hours at the weekend and by the time I get to those sessions, I'm totally exhausted. You know, you're on your feet a lot. You're spending your whole time motivating, trying to get the best out of other people. And I think with coaches, you're always, you're always the person in the leadership position. There's very few coaches that have someone coaching them. So the coach is always expected to have all the answers. The players come to the coach for the answers. Their parents come to the coach for the answers. Quite often there might be assistant coaches and developing coaches will come to the head coach for the answers but no one's actually coaching the head coach and that can be like quite a quite a demoralizing thing at times you you, you don't really get any guidance and it can um yeah that, that that's something that i struggle with i think as well another another part of coaching that is interesting and i did touch on this a little bit earlier is that it's really messy like it's hard to navigate whether you're doing a good job or not 
you'll constantly, as you coach more, question what you're doing. And you'll, you'll start to question whether you're actually helping the players or not. That's something that's, uh, I think, a challenge for many coaches and is definitely for myself. I'll leave sessions and think, you know, did I actually help the kids get better in that session? But I think asking those questions and reflecting is all part of, of the process of becoming a better coach. But on the whole, the, the fact that, you know, I get to spend most of my day, a, a portion of every day, doing something that I'm incredibly passionate about, that I, I loved for many years as, as a player and as an athlete. I, I, do, I do love it and I do enjoy it, but it's not easy. So that would be, um, that would be my message on that to any, any up-and-coming coaches or people that are considering going into coaching as a profession. Yes, you are absolutely agree. Personally, myself, I've, been, I've never been a full-time badminton coach or anything like that. But yes, I was one of the players who did do coaching on the side. And yes, I was one of the coaches that felt that the players that I coached should be doing what I believe they should do. For example, for technical things or certain tactical skills and, and things like that. And it was just recently that I was just away at the World Championships in Switzerland and I was coaching the Australian teams at the World Championships there. And it really helped me to understand what you said before about understanding the person, not just the, not just the sport and not just the tactics, not just the training, but understanding what individuals actually need rather than what, what I think they need. It's something that you do your very best at. And sometimes you do have those doubts in your mind thinking, hey, was that the right thing to do? Or did they actually get something out of that? And then just kind of switching gears a bit professionally i'm also a business coach for dental practice owners and i get the same kind of thing so there are certain things that i know that i need to be telling the clients but sometimes you get that niggle in the back of your brain thinking hey was that actually beneficial or is this the right thing to be saying and i think a lot of that is just the process of coaching itself because we can't really predict what's going to happen we can just give our best advice and our best recommendation based on the information that we actually have so I think that's really important for coaches out there that they understand coaching as a whole rather than just when you see a coach winning something. For example, when their player wins a title and you see the coach really happy and celebrating, there's a lot more than just that celebration. It's like an iceberg. There's a lot more underneath the surface than you actually think. Yeah, totally agree, Jeff. When you were talking about that then, it made me realize as well that I hadn't talked about the importance of versatility as a coach, that you have to be flexible, in my opinion, with your ideas. Not that's both from a, a people perspective and a and a technical perspective. Not what what works for one person in both technique as well as you know the, the psychological side of things might not work for another person. And you have to be flexible. If you if you're always you still have to have your own um, what do they call it? like like a coaching philosophy, the sort of coach that you want to be and what your values are. And obviously, you're going to have things that you think for the masses work well but that still doesn't mean that you have to fix every player to be exactly the same mold you, you don't want to create the same players over and over again you want people to have their own styles and you to be able to adapt with them that that makes a good coach as well that, that's great Stu. Stu, i can see that coaching is something that's really close to your heart and you're really passionate about you're in a role that you really do love, although it's very busy, but it's probably, from what I can hear, a dream role for you because you get to stay, stay in the sport, you get to coach, you get to have variation in your day as well. So out of all these things related to coaching, what would be the thing that you enjoy the most? What's the thing you're fondest about when you actually do coach and when you have coached in the past? I think the, the most special thing for me, like I think I did touch on this earlier as well, is that I... I get to spend time with young people doing something they are incredibly passionate about. And it's probably the thing they do in their life that they get the most satisfaction, happiness from. That's quite rare to be able to say that you do that. All the players that I work with, some of them I wouldn't even call players. They're just kids trying a sport. So these, these kids, they don't get forced to play badminton. They choose to come to badminton because they love playing. And I'm not forcing, I'm not going out there and saying, you must come to training, you must play badminton. They're turning up to my sessions at school privately and opting to be part of the Badminton Australia program because they love badminton. They want to pursue it as a career or be the best they can be or just try the sport at the very beginning. So that, that for me is, is, is really special. And probably even more so is that I get to watch 
and spend time with somebody who maybe has picked up badminton for the first time when they're seven, eight, nine years old, and I get to see them grow the whole way through if they choose to keep playing badminton. I work with players that are eight years old, and sometimes I get to take them all the way through until they transition to senior badminton. So I've watched a kid go through puberty, through everything. You know, I've seen them go from a silly little kid to a really um, charismatic, confident, you know, person go from a beginner badminton player to a, you know, a professional badminton player. So you become a really, really big part of their life, not just in terms of their badminton, but in other things you talk about their social life, their school life, you're, you're, you're bigger than just, just badminton. And I think a lot of people out there probably wouldn't understand that in coaching. And some coaches might be different to me. They might just keep badminton, you know, once they're on the court with a kid, that's badminton. They're coaching the player in badminton, but they don't get involved on the other side. Whereas for me, that's the thing I enjoy is that I get to know these kids on a deeper level, which makes, you know, coaching them to win national titles and international events even more special because they, you feel like they're, a, they're almost family. You've, seen, you've known them for, for a decade. So that's um, the coach-player relationship is, is, is really special to me. And it's probably the thing that makes me want to continue coaching for the rest of my life. Great, Stu. It sounds like a really fulfilling thing to be doing. And like you said, you know, these kids seem like their family. You watch them grow, essentially, and watch them become much better badminton players than when they first got to you. What I want to talk about now is what are three take-home pieces of advice or actions you'd recommend for someone listening? So my first bit of advice would be for someone who is looking for a coach. So I think it's quite common that people look for good players to coach them, that it's not necessary that a coach has been a good player or can beat you to be able to help you improve as a badminton player. What's more important is that you, you have a good relationship. I think for me, what highlights this more than anything is that sometimes actually in tournaments, the person who I felt could help me the most was actually my dad. He knew me better than anybody. Even though he knew very little about badminton, he knew me as a person. He could read my emotions and that he could be open and honest with me about the situation. So please, when you're looking for a coach, don't just think about whether they're a good player or not. Judge them as a person. My second piece of advice is, is for somebody who has a coach. Do not be afraid to ask your coach questions. It should be a collaborative relationship. It should be two-way. You should both have the same goal throughout the whole process and um, journey of your coaching or coach player relationship you should constantly be communicating reassessing goals and working together um, and my final piece of advice is for somebody who's already a coach and out there and out there working keep reflecting on what you're doing keep trying new things and don't worry it is okay to feel a bit lost at times coaching is messy and you won't always feel like you're making progress they're my three pieces of advice for, for, for badminton people out there um, re related to coaching. Great, Stu. They're really important. And I think a lot of people will get a lot of benefit from following those tips and pieces of advice. So thanks for giving us those. And I know that there's probably going to be some further questions for you as people continue down their pathway of being a coach or being a player or looking to be a coach, for example. So if any of the listeners actually want to connect with you, how would they be able to do that? So people can connect with me on, on Facebook. So if you search Stu Rollins, so my Facebook name is STU and then my surname Rollins, feel free to private message me on there. Or alternatively, I'm happy for people to email me on my Badminton Australia email, which is jhp at badminton.org.au. Thanks, Stu. And thank you so much for coming onto this podcast. We really appreciate having you on and all the valuable pieces of advice that you have provided for us and the audience. Absolute pleasure, boys. Thanks for having me. I'd also like to just finish by um, complimenting Henry and, um, and Jeff on, on your new brand and wishing you all the best with Volant. I think it's a great idea. I love the kit. I think there's definitely a, um, a space in badminton for that active wear look and, um, I'd love to rock some of your gear at some point, guys. So thanks again for having me. I'm sure we could organize that for you. Stu, there were so many key and invaluable takeaways from our conversation today. And 
for me, I think the really important one that I really resonate with is if you are actually a coach and you're listening, sometimes just having that sensational feeling that you might not know if something's quite right or you don't know if you're providing the best value because that's what we're about. As coaches, we're being of service. We're trying to give value to our players and we're trying to make them the best they can possibly be. And sometimes we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to deliver, deliver, deliver. And that can be tiring, can be stressful. And at the same time, a lot of it, I feel, is probably just self-inflicted. The players are probably not feeling that anxiety about you not fulfilling your role as best as you could be. And I think that we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as coaches. So for me, that was really important to hear that another coach out there also has those feelings that, look, sometimes I'm not that sure if this is the absolute right thing to do. But as long as the right intention is there, at the end of the day, that's, that's what's going to get us to the next step. And for me, what I really liked about Stu and our podcast today is that he is in a constant state of progression. He has a very enheightened sense of self-awareness. Although it sounds like he's questioning himself all the time, it does, it does seem like he's doing whatever he can to be the best coach possible. And the other thing that I really liked about what Stu has talked about today is that developing the relationship between the coach and the player and being able to watch them grow as both a player and as a person because, as he said, it is a collaborative process. It is a two-way street and that you're working together for the same mission, that same goal, for them to become a better player and to actually have a fulfilling relationship with them as well. So for everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning in to the Badminton Podcast. We're going to continue to push you to grow both as a person and as a player with special guests like Stuart Rowland. Make sure that you just keep loving the sport and keep sharing that love with everyone that you know so that we can show the world how incredible badminton is. And if you want to connect with us, you can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and on our website at www.volantware.com. For our social media, our handle is volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. We hope to see you at our next podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.